Um, well, hi everyone. Hope everyone's keeping well. And a special welcome, especially to those of you who are participating in the international rounds of the uh, Monroe Prize Media Law Moot Court competition next week. I hope everyone's really excited for the rounds, uh, but I'm sure you must also be quite nervous at the same time. So this is really a good time for you to quickly go over some useful mooting tips that one should know one week before the international rounds. And we are uh, incredibly grateful to Maria Jose Escobar for agreeing to join us and speak to all the participants. Um, but before I give her the floor, let me quickly introduce her. Uh, Maria graduated from the University of Bucharest with a degree in law in July 2021. She is currently a full-time volunteer in a Romanian association that works for the promotion of women in society. And she hopes to start an LLM in international law at the University of um, Vienna next semester. Uh, importantly, during her undergraduate study, she participated in both the Philip C. Jessup International Law Moot and the Monroe Prize Media Law Moot, where she won the Best Oralist Award in the international rounds. So we really couldn't have asked for a better person to lead today's session. Um, just a quick housekeeping rule, if you have any questions for Maria, please feel free to type them out in the chat, both during or immediately after her initial presentation, and she will take the questions uh, towards the end of today's session. Uh, all right, over to you, Maria. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Um, effectively, I was lucky enough to participate both in the Jessup Moot and in the 2019, I think, 2020 uh, Romanian National Rounds. And then I participated in last year's edition of the Price Media Moot. Um, I think this gives me enough, maybe enough authority to start by congratulating, congratulating you guys for taking on this challenge. Um, these activities, I think, are particularly amazing because you've had the privilege to spend six months deep diving into extremely controversial discussions that are taking part in the public discourse. And now I feel like you have the responsibility to use all of the information that you have acquired to actually empower yourselves to, to know um, the standards to which your human rights must be defended and to actually um, um, use, use, use uh, your position to, to, to also advance them. So, yes. So when I was speaking with the organizers and they actually, uh, asked me if I would like to, to give out this Mooing Masterclass. I started to think what I could actually say that would be useful. And I decided to sort of sit with myself from one year ago and sort of brainstorm every single thing I would have liked to know before the international rounds actually started. And I think it, I, my pen, every single idea that came through my pen to the paper it, came, it was a very decent, a very decent list, and I decided to sort of divide these ideas into three different categories, which is uh, preparation, delivery, and dealing with questions. Um, it is true that maybe section three could be a subsection of section two, because questions are in fact part of the delivery for the oral rounds. But I just feel that questions are such an essential part of mooting that they deserve their own uh, separate uh, section. And in a way, if you think about it, I, at least that's the way I see it. Questions are what sets, one of the key features that sets mooting apart from other public uh, speaking exercises, such as maybe speech giving or debates. And I think they're also one of the hardest parts of our speeches. So, so yes, that's why I decided to have a complete section dedicated to them. But now, the preparation. <laughs> I first like to acknowledge the fact that I am perfectly aware that you guys are like six days, you, uh, you said before, six days, one, one week maybe from from the international rounds actually starting. 
but and it may feel like a very short time but a lot can be done in six days let me tell you like a speech can be undone and build back up in six days so i actually do hope that these tips would be useful as a sort of background music in this last sprint you're about to take so my first idea is that i would like to start by saying um very important but maybe hard pill to swallow and that is that there is no perfect argument um this is very important to internalize if you acknowledge the fact that there is no perfect argument you'll actually have enough mental space to become your own devil's advocate and sort of bombard even what you think to be your strongest points with questions mm. And when you do that, you'll actually be in a position to, to see the weak, the weak spots of your line of reasoning. This is very, very important, as I was saying before, because judges are definitely going to want to push you to see on how far you're willing to take a certain point. And I just think that learning when to concede or when to stop are two very important skills that a motor should have. And I definitely think they would, um, they could define the winner of a match. If you keep pushing an argument when it's clearly not the case anymore, the judges are gonna, are gonna notice that and they're gonna, they might punish you in your scores for doing so because that, that would mean that you didn't understand the point you were trying to make and we would like to avoid that at all costs. So once you, um, once you have, as I said before, internalized the fact that each argument has a weak spot, you'll be able to, to, better, um, you, to better study it and to actually get to, to, the, to the heart of it. Now, on to as I'm, I'm sorry, someone's ringing the bell. I'm in my dorm right now. Um, I hope that doesn't, that doesn't interfere with with the way you, you hear me. My second point would be to not underestimate the both creative and destructive power of case law. And this is especially for my colleagues that uh, also come from a civil law tradition. I feel like we, we're not necessarily very used to using this source uh, very directly. And this may come as a sort of cultural shock, but um, we might be tempted to use case law as a sort of magic wand that just like by waving a case into to the judge's face in a sort, we're like avoiding addressing um, uh, logical gaps in our line of reasoning. And that's not how case law works. So in order to use a case, we need to really understand, we really need to understand it like my first post it says we really need to understand the case that we want to use and i know that some mooters have the strategy of sort of having a list with all the cases they want to they want to um to use during their speech and have sort of all the factual background maybe even uh, the year that the case was decided or the outcome of, of that particular uh, judicial decision in case they're asked by the judges. But in my personal opinion, that is not enough. You really want to understand the reasoning of the court. And this is especially important if you're, some people do this. I think I've also, at least when I was starting with uh, my mooting journey, <laughs> I did this a lot, which was to maybe take an obscure sentence in the middle of a paragraph and sort of like try to apply it 100% to the point I was making. And this might work once or twice, but it can also be the case that a judge is personally familiar, familiar with the case you're citing, and they're gonna wanna they're gonna push you on why you think that re the, the fact that the court reached that reasoning also applies to your particular um, conclusion. So this isn't the end of the world. If that happens, if the judge starts bombarding you with questions about the case law that you've chosen, but just be prepared that this might happen because it'd be a pity for you to, to just <clears throat> dive 
into a situation that you're not going to be able to 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 face. Mm, on a very similar note, if you're heavily relying on a certain institution or maybe doctrine, be sure that or maybe be curious enough and actually um, motivate yourself to check if that particular doctrine is unanimously applied among, among, among jurisdictions, or if on the contrary, it is accepted by some courts and maybe rejected by others, or it is if it is very specific to, to a human rights protection mechanism and it's not used anywhere else in the globe. Again, this isn't necessarily bad, but it'd be a pity for you to be asked that question by the judges and not be able to come with an answer to why you're using that uh, particular doctrine if the rest of the world does not use it. So um, challenge yourself to, to, to be curious enough to check how that same problem is dealt with in other parts of the world. It is a very fun way and a very easy way to gain points. And also, this leads me to my third point, which is that I'd highly encourage you guys to di geographically diversify your sources as much as possible. Um, I once had a judge, she told me that uh, the Price Media Law Mood had a comparative law spirit, I remember. And if we take that into account, um, we should use that premise to encourage ourselves to actually get out of our comfort zones and don't be afraid and challenge ourselves to actually not be afraid to look into national court decisions or to not be to not cave into the temptation of maybe stopping at the most prolific courts, but actually going a little bit a step further and maybe taking the time to go through case law that has been decided by, um, I'm gonna use the word underrated, it's not necessarily correct, but I'm gonna go with that one, to more, un more underrated courts. That would definitely be um, an advice and that one that I would have liked to, I would have, I would have liked to know one week before the mood started. So if you have been citing a single court through your speech and you have another human rights protection mechanism that would help you to make the exact same court, uh, the exact same point, I'd warmly encourage you to use that other source. It might seem like a small detail, but I think that judges highly would highly appreciate are highly appreciative on geographical diversity, and they do pick up on the fact that you have uh, done your homework around the world, around the globe, to say in one way. Okay, and my last tip regarding preparation. This is uh, also maybe on a more personal level. Mm. Understand that each pleading that you're taking on is standing on months on months of hard work by your part of effort. If you have, if you have that in mind, I, mot I really encourage you to take that as your, so for your psychological advantage, because don't get me wrong, uh, public speaking soft skills, body language, rhetoric, these are all very important assets and you should be working uh, to master those as much as possible. But the type of clarity that comes from knowing that you know what you're talking about is very refreshing. And people tend to pick up on it, not only judges, but also the team you're pleading against. And to my understanding, that's the sort of confidence that you want. So yes, definitely draw confidence from the knowledge that you have acquired. That's a very important tool and one that I'd highly encourage you to uh, use. Uh, and now maybe a more pragmatic tip regarding preparation is to try and read the facts of the case at least once before your first rounds. Um, why am I saying this? Because some of you might be in the position that you've only read you've only read the case until you finish the summary of facts part of your memorial and then when that was done you sort of like never never took a look at uh, a look at them again that's not necessarily bad but 
when you have the doctrinal, the complete doctrinal picture to say one way, you'll, you'll read the facts of the case in a very different light. And you'll be able to pick up on details that you didn't notice before, details that would either help you or maybe hurt your argument. And again, it would be a pity for you to not make use of those whenever possible. It only takes you a couple of minutes, if not five, what, five, 10 minutes at, at tops. And I guarantee they're not, they're not gonna be wasted. I know you, you might, all of, all of you might be feeling short of time at this point, but this is a very, a very good investment that I, I recommend. Um, now onto the big day, the delivery, the oral rounds per se. So personally, I tend to become extremely anxious when the oral presentations are coming. The day before a pleading, I usually barely, I barely can have any breakfast. Uh, all of my insecurities start coming, start coming to me. I think I, I keep thinking that I'm going to get the most severe judges in the whole competition or that I'm simply going to blank out. And at least personally, I can tell you that it is never, at least almost never, as bad as you think. Um, I am particularly aware that I have been very lucky. I've had some very generous and kind judges and maybe some people have had a more, um, I'm going to say, a different experience. But even if it is as bad as you think, it's not as bad. It's not the end of the world. I, I once, I heard about someone. Uh, this was when, this was pre-pandemic. So before the, um, before, before the online situation was happening, the mooding was taking part in Oxford. And this person had taken like, five cups of coffee, I think, before his pleading. And I think he got like a caffeine overdose in the middle of his speech or something. And he sort of passed out. He didn't like faint or anything. He just, he's just, his head uh, collapsed for like 30 seconds. It wasn't such a big deal. But for me, that would be a worst case scenario. And as I was saying, he managed to pick himself up and finish his speech. Um, of course, he, I, I don't think he won that round, but he got very constructive feedback from the judges. Um, everyone was very, 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 so showed a lot of solidarity with him. And I think at the end of the day it was just a very beautiful experience overall and that he learned a lot from it. So as I was saying, even if it is as bad as you think, it's not the end of the world. So having said that, I'll address my first uh, point, which is that feeling comfortable with your speech trumps knowing your speech by heart. And I know these two aren't incompatible. I've seen people, amazing speakers take the stand with nothing but a paper with three ideas written by hand, and they've done amazingly. They've had amazing speeches. But um, that's my opinion. I know, I know once I had a coach who, would, who really did not like for us to try and memorize our speeches because he felt that it would almost condemn us to a very rigid approach. And he was right in the sense that we must try to avoid rigidity at all costs. Why? Because um, you're going to want to move ideas around. You're going to want to be able to move ideas around. In, I think by now you might have noticed that with each different pleading, your speech changes a little bit. That is completely normal. And you should, I think personally, that you should be striving for that. In a sense, that means that you are reacting to the stimuli that you're getting from the judges and also for, from the team that you're pleading against. This is especially true if you are the respondent. If you are the respondent and your, your speech has remained stiff by each and every one of your, of your pleadings, I'd be a little bit worried because that would mean that you are not using the arguments that the applicant the applicant changes with each match. So I don't think you've had to plead with the same applicant um, twice or three times. 
So that would mean that you're not using the arguments that the applicant, you're not refuting the arguments that the applicant is throwing against you. And I feel that that would be definitely, that would be a pity because you can win a lot of points by directly addressing the arguments the applicant is trying to make. So <clears throat> yes, your speech should be changing. You should be reacting to stimuli and you should be trying to move ideas around. If you can do that and know your speech by heart, amazing. But if maybe learning your speech or memorizing your speech leads to you sort of reciting a poem, I would, I, would, I would say that it's much better to try and shake that off and sort of like explain your ideas so you can have as much flexibility as possible. Um, I know that the need or the feeling of need to memorize your pleadings comes from a point of seeking security, from a place of seeking security. But what I would tell you in this case is that it is completely okay to take a glimpse at your notes from time to time. The judges are not gonna mind. They might not even notice if you do it, um, if you do it delicately enough to say one way. Of course, I'm not saying that it's okay to read your speech, but being able to say your speech and maybe read an idea or two is not gonna hurt anyone. This is especially if you're also a non-native speaker, because sometimes, at least this has been my experience, phonetically speaking, it, it can be hard to get some words together when your, your tongue's not really used to combining certain, certain sounds. So if you have to read a sentence because you're having trouble uh, phonetically getting an idea out, that's completely fine. Clarity is much better than, than rigidity, and we're definitely gonna wanna go to, through that approach. So, on a very similar idea, I like to remind you all that the goal is not to finish your speech under any circumstance. That is not what you want to do. What you want to do is to convince the judges. And that does not mean that you're, you shouldn't strive to say your ideal speech. Of course, you're going to strive to do that. But let me tell you that I don't think you're ever going to be able to do that. You're never going to be able to say your ideal speech. Uh, I'm sorry, but that's the truth. And the, the fastest you actually accept this idea, the better, the, the fastest you're going to be able to embrace it and to actually sort of use that to your advantage and take control of your speech. How do we do this? Well, this was the approach I took and I found it to be very helpful, not necessarily pragmatically. It was very helpful pragmatically speaking. I did not miss, I did not go through a, through a match in which I, I, I thought to myself, oh, I really missed this point. I, I should have said that before, no. But what I mean is that this is incredibly helpful psychologically speaking, because you know you're in control of your time and you're in control of the ideas that you're sharing. So the approach that I took and the one that I'm sharing with you guys is to try and divide your arguments or classify your arguments into necessary, important, and useful. When I say necessary, I mean imperative. So you there is no way that you're gonna let your time run out before you say uh, these types of of points they're not a lot like that's why they're imperative they're usually one or two or maximum three for each uh issue and when you have these when you have figure out which are your necessary um, arguments what I did was that I timed how much, how much I timed myself explaining them. And so I could figure out how much time it took for me to actually share them with the judges. This would grant me the freedom to see if maybe when they show you the little flashcards, <laughs> if I saw that I had five minutes left and that one of my key arguments took three minutes to, to share, then I would try to close 
the argument I was finishing as fast as possible and to go on to address the necessary argument. So in case the judges had any other questions, I would be able to live at peace knowing that I said what I had to say. Um, so yeah, the important and useful arguments, of course, as I said before, you're gonna want to strive to say them, but um, they can be, you can give them up. If, it's, if, it, if it comes to that point, you, you can give them up. And always keeping in mind that both the rebuttal and the start rebuttal and also questions are great moments to bring them up if you can. So as I said before, do not be afraid to move ideas around. So maybe if a judge asks, asks you about the proportionality standard, uh, the proportionality, proportionality principle a little bit before, use that, use, that, use that question to say the proportionality argument and don't go back to it because that would mean that you're wasting unnecessary time. And by doing this, the judges sort of know that uh, you have worked on your time management. Um, and this will also allow you to not rush. I actually, I remember, I remember I used to get this feedback a lot, especially when I was starting to not rush because I'd sort of enter into a frenzy when I saw that I only had three minutes left and I thought I had almost, I'm, like a, I'm exaggerating, but maybe uh, one part of my speech without, uh, I was gonna leave one part of my speech without addressing. So I sort of panicked and like cramped 10, five arguments into three minutes. And I, would, I remember my coach would always tell me like, not, do not rush, do not rush. And I was like, well, I can because I'm, I'm leaving half of my speech out, what do I do? And it was only until we kind of switched roles within our team and I started like judging uh, my teammates. You, could, you can see when someone's rushing and it's not, it's not a good look. That means that the person uh, is struggling with their time management. And as I said before, no one knows. I don't know, actually, I don't think I've said this before. No one knows what your ideal speech looks like. You're the only one that knows that. So it'd be a pity for you to, um, to let everyone know by the way you're delivering your speech that you weren't able to finish when no one has to know that. Absolutely no one. So, so, be in control. You are the one who decides which, are the, which ideas are being said and which ideas are being left out. And um, stand by your decision and trust yourself in this, in this regard. Mm, and just to finish my, my delivery section, um, I would like to remind us all <laughs> that judges are humans too. And in this case, it's because it's very common that judges sort of lapse out out of your, when you're giving your speech, they might lose uh, concentration or maybe lose track of what you're trying to say. This is normal. This can happen even if you're doing a fantastic job, even if you're, if you're having a fantastic uh, body language, if you're stressing words, if you're, if you're changing your intonation, it may still happen that judges get distracted. Mm, it is okay. And what we must keep in mind is that it is our job to drag them back to our speech, to sort of like remind them what we're talking about. So a great way to do this is, as I said before, constantly remind them in which part of your speech, which, be, which part of your speech you're addressing. And most importantly, remind them when you're drawing a conclusion. So if you're drawing a conclusion, remind them, quickly remind them what the issue was, tell them that you're concluding the issue and share the conclusion that you're arriving to. Mm, in a bit this, but a little bit of in a macro level, I remember one of my coaches was pretty insistent that we would always have, we would always say the prayer for leave. I remember I did not understand this. I still don't think I quite understand his insistence, but I said to myself, like, look, he's the judge, he's the coach. He knows what he's talking. He knows, he knows what he's talking about. He knows what he's doing. So I would always try and add and say the prayer of relief, even if that meant giving up an argument. 
And I remember, especially during the regional rounds of the prize, we got praised a lot as a team for doing this and for taking this approach, uh, especially when or maybe the teams we're playing against didn't, didn't do that. And yes, the judges loved it. They loved it when we said the prayer for relief. And they said that it was very helpful for them to be reminded what we wanted, to, what we wanted them to rule, what we were seeking from them. So yes, that is a sort of also a bonus tip um, to always say the prayer for, for relief. That's, I think that's definitely something I would have liked to know one year before, um, one, year, one week before the international mood, uh, the international round started last week, um, last year, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and in another note, I also, I haven't seen this, I've seen this mostly in training when everyone's starting, but I feel the responsibility to share this tip with you guys in case someone needs to hear it. And that is to rephrase or repeat or explain again as many times it is needed to the judges. It is our job as mooters to take them by the hand and walk them through our line of reasoning. And we can only do that with, uh, with as much patience as possible. So if maybe you get asked a question which you think, which you really don't understand or you don't see the point of it, try not to get frustrated, try not to get to use a frustrated tone, try not to roll your eyes. Um, remember that it is your, your job to convince the judges and you, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to do that um, as delicately as possible. If you take more of a uh, rough approach, I don't think anyone's gonna appreciate that. So yes. Then again, a pragmatic tip. I'm sure you have you have heard this before from your teammates or your coaches or simply it's a very intuitive tip. So I think it might, even if you haven't heard, heard it from anyone, it might have popped into your mind to record yourself while you're pleading. And that is especially because you guys are gonna be pleading online, if I'm correct. So unwanted gestures become much more evident, especially if you're talking directly to the camera as I'm doing right now, your face is much closer. The judges are gonna have a much closer look at your face. So again, it'd be a pity for you guys to lose points in style because you didn't, uh, you didn't to you didn't take the steps necessary to see if there was anything on your delivery that needed to be on your external delivery that needed to be corrected before the mood started. So now my favorite part, <laughs> how to deal with questions. Um, no one is really sure. So what I wrote here is that no one is really sure if a cold bench is better than a hot bench. Uh, for those of you who don't know, a cold bench is what people call a group of judges that don't really ask you questions. And a hot bench is a group of judges that on the contrary asks you, interrupts you all the time. It's, you basically are not able to, to say one phrase without being interrupted. Um, I have experienced both. Uh, a cold bench and a hot bench. And I would definitely say that a hot bench is 10 times better than, um, than a cold bench. Why? Precisely because uh, you know that the judges are engaged in your presentation. In the cold bench, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you, that you're doing anything wrong. It just means that the judges are sort of letting you go with the flow. But regardless, of you knowing that it doesn't necessarily mean anything. At least for me, I always had the underlying idea that they were bored with my speech or something of the sort. So I definitely, I definitely say that I would prefer um, a hot bench. And um, this leads me to my first point, which is to learn to love questions. Again, I don't know, you might have noticed by my presentation, but I am a firm believer that 
doing well in a mood is partially because you have done psychological preparation beforehand. I think that's a very important part of the whole process. And if you, if you, if you learn to love questions or at least welcome them with an open heart, to say one way, you will have much more room to use them to your advantage. And when I wrote this tip, I learned to love questions, I was like, Captain Obvious, we would all like to learn to love questions. We would all like to love questions. How do we do it? And I decided that the only, really the only way to do it is to try and find silver linings because I must say, I do sympathize with people who maybe feel intimidated by the fact that they're constantly being interrupted with questions, especially if you if you start with the wrong feet and don't know the answer to the first questions you were asked, you can sort of enter into panic mode and, and it can hurt your overall argument. But again, as I said before, it's much better to get questions than to not get questions at all. So I wanted to share with you three of my silver linings, <laughs> which I which have helped me to to, to see questions as an opportunity to, that I can use to actually better myself, better my argument, better myself, and in the long run, learn more from the whole match. So the first idea is that questions are a fantastic chance to interact with experts. And this is the coolest thing ever, honestly, if you think about it. Last year, I had a very, a very, a particularly satisfying experience. Um, I was judged by a person to who, to whose work I had become familiar when I was preparing for the for the mood. So while I was writing the memorials, I had, I think, I, I listened to a conference this person gave, and when I saw her uh, sitting at the panel, I. I, I fangirled really, really, really hard. It was, and it was such a pleasure, such a beautiful experience to receive questions from her. It was, as I said, it was a beautiful experience and I can only wish that for every single one of you. It was, I think it was peak of my year, peak of my undergraduate student studies, it was peak everything. So yes, it is a fantastic chance to talk with people who actually understand the topic that you're dealing with and to be challenged in that, in that way, it is extremely satisfying. So second, there's also a chance to show off all of the effort, all of the studying that you have made, that you have, that you have accomplished and not only to a chance to show off to the judges in a way, or to your coach or to your teammates, but also a chance to prove to yourself that you did your homework. That's also very satisfying when you're able to answer a question. Um, it is an extremely uh, good feeling. And also questions can be incredibly useful tools uh, when delivering your speech. You, as I said before, if you didn't have time to maybe address a, an issue, but you see a tiny window that's being presented to you by a question to actually sort of, of introduce that authority or maybe introduce that point, um, you can you definitely use them. So yes, questions can be incredibly useful tools for your for the delivery of your arguments. And another psychological um, phrase that you can tell yourself to better approach questions is to know that questions are definitely not meant to hurt you. I mean, some judges may seem like they're being overly aggressive sometimes, but that is usually not the case. The questions get asked for three main reasons, mostly. First is because the judges want to quiz you. Second is because they want to clarify. And third is because they want to discuss uh, the point that you're trying to deliver. So with quiz questions, I feel like sometimes we think as mooters, this happens because during training, our coaches are usually asking us quizzing questions because they want to make sure we understand the law and that we know the case, the case fact, the facts of the case really well. So we're constantly um, we're constantly receiving these questions, and we might think that these are the most numerous questions we receive while in the actual round. That is usually not the case. 
Mm, it's not mm, it's not the most common that a judge wants to know what year a case law a particular case that you're signing was decided but it can happen what i would like you guys to know in this case is that um it is not the end of the world if you don't know the answer to a quiz question judges usually know when they're being demanding and they tend to be very indulging so if you don't know uh, the answer to a yes or no to a to a quiz question that's aimed to see if you actually understand uh, if you actually know the facts of of the case or know the facts of a particular case that you're dealing with or that you actually know the outline yes of an institution don't panic it's okay on the other hand clarifying questions they're more common than we think and again i think this dates back to training because our 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 coaches have walked us through our line of reasoning so they might not have as much trouble understanding what we're trying to share with them as judges who are hearing our pleadings for the first time. But judges tend to ask these questions when they either did not understand at all what you were trying to say or they want to have a um, broader glimpse of your argument. On the contrary to prison questions, if you get a clarifying question wrong, I do think that's that bad because that would mean that a judge is leaving the match having a wrong idea of what you were trying to say and we would like to avoid that at all costs so do not be afraid to take your time do not be afraid to as I was saying before to repeat or rephrase as much as it's necessary and being have a very delicate approach to these sort of questions do not be pushy and with quizzing questions you might want to be like standing your ground a little bit more firm. But with clarifying questions, you wanna be a little, more, a little bit more delicate. And then the third type of questions, these don't happen a lot, but they're definitely very fun uh, to see. Um, and it's when a judge generally enjoys your argument and he just wants to have a conversation with you about it. Um, they're very fun to see as both, I guess, they're very fun to experience as a mooter and they're very fun to see as, an ex as a spectator. So yes, in this case, I would advise you guys to just uh, enjoy the ride and, and have fun. Uh, now, a bonus tip, because if we gave a bonus tip for each section, I think that it wouldn't be fair to leave the questions by themselves. So this tip is to try and answer yes or no questions with a yes or no answer. You can develop afterwards, but don't be afraid to be direct when the judges are also taking a direct approach because that's usually what they expect. And that will definitely give you points for confidence. So thank you guys. I think that's everything that was on my brainstorming list. I really do think uh, this was helpful. I'm going to check, maybe check the chat if there are any questions. Um, no, no, there aren't any questions. Okay, so I think that was, that was it. I want to wish all of you guys that are advanced, that advanced to international rounds, um, good luck. I hope that you learn a lot from the experience. And most of all, I hope that you guys have fun um, with the other teams and with the judges. There seem to be a bunch of questions in the chat now. Do you, ah. you want to take a look at them? They, they just came in. Ah, um, ah I just, I, well, wait, hold on. So do you have any advice on rebuttal? Oh, okay, yeah, I just, I think I just saw them, yes. So do you have any advice on rebuttals? I do have an advice on rebuttals, actually. Uh, this was very helpful for me, and I actually am very thankful that I did this. It's to take a very close look to the memorials, if you're able, what, because I think you're able, you receive the memorials from the team you're playing against in advance. So take a close look at those, take a close look at those and analyze them carefully, because it's very likely, especially if you're the applicant, I mean, of course, if you're the respondent, you're going to want to do that for your pleading. But if you're the applicant, uh, that might give you um, a heads up on what the respondents, on the approach the respondents may want to look. So just simply write um, 
uh, an answer to each one of the arguments that you think is worth answering and just have that already prepared in a way. And then see, uh, carefully listen to their speech. If they, man if they happen to say one of these uh, arguments that you had already answered by studying their memorials, then you can go that, you can use that to your advantage. And actually having the chance to take uh, a look at, at their memorials with a clear head, it is, it's very, it's very helpful to do a very good rebuttal. So that's, that would be my tip to actually come in prepared. And if you're the respondent, I, I've never been a respondent and I, I, I usually plead as an applicant. So maybe what my tip is, is to kind of train yourself to be a quick, as a, a quick thinker as possible because um, that's actually what you're gonna need, a quick head to know what to answer to the applicants. Okay, uh, the other question. Question, if there are three elements of a test, do you have to go through each element or can you focus just on just one or two elements for time purpose? Um, I definitely encourage you to have, uh, to address all of the, elements in at least in the outline of your speech but I, as I was saying before at least for me it happened once or twice that I wasn't able to address an element at all but again I knew which element was the trickiest the one I wanted to approach earlier and the one that was already that worked in my favor so if you see that you're not going to have time to address one of the elements uh, kindly let the judges know that because you see there's a lack of time, because you see that your time is running out. And of course, with their permission, you'd like to kindly direct them to your memorials in section, I don't know, B of your memorials to where you address that particular, um, that particular element of the test. So yes, don't be afraid to do, at least don't do it a lot. <laughs> don't direct them to the memorials five times in your speech. But once, it's definitely not bad. And as I said before, if you if you know which which arguments you want to address, it's it's perfect. Uh, give me some tips for making yeah. So that was for bottles. How can we gracefully answer a question we don't really have an answer for? Mm, I think that's a very a very good question. Um, the first step would be to ask the judge to reformulate. Don't be afraid to do that. Um, especially there are some judges that are, aren't also native speakers. So maybe they had trouble clearly formulating the question they want to give you. So if you give them another chance to, to maybe say it from a different approach, it can be, it can be uh, better for you guys to, to ask that the judges to do that, first of all. Second of all, if you do not know the answer to a question, you can always tell them that you cannot, you cannot be in, of any assistance to the court in this regard. Um, you can. That's always a graceful answer, but that's only in a quiz question. I think if it's a clarifying question, you're you're gonna want to address that because, as I said before, otherwise it means that the judge is gonna leave uh, having a wrong idea of what you wanted to say. Um, mm, I hope that I answer your question, but just so you know, I, this, I have a story that kind of comes into my, into mind. I remember one, one match we had, we had a very hot bench, not only because we're, I wasn't, I wasn't pleading. I was, um, an spectator. My team was pleading. Um, mm, the judges weren't giving, were giving us, were giving them a lot of questions. They were very complicated and they were very insistent when they didn't get the answer they wanted to, to get from, from the mooters. So I remember a particular interaction when I was thinking, uh, this poor person is like getting bombarded and he was actually doing a very good job. So I sort of felt like he was getting hurt by all of these line of questioning that I didn't, it seemed completely unnecessary for me. So I, I felt really sorry for him. But at the end of the match, he actually, he won that match. He got the highest scores. It was because the judges were highly appreciative of the fact that he took the time, he took, he took on the challenge, he was very patient. He tried his best to, to answer every question. And as I said before, judges know when they're asking a lot from you, 
and they don't expect any miracles. So also keep that into, into mind. Uh, what structure for a memorial would you recommend? Break, me, break it down for me kindly. Well, actually, mm, I think for a memorial or for, I'm not sure if you mean for a memorial or for a speech, but if you're talking for a speech, um, I sort of go with the same structure you're actually using in your memorial. So maybe start by, um, I don't want to get a lot into detail because I don't want to give any, give out any clues that I might not want to give. But um, yes, start by telling the judges actually the map of your case. So sort of tell them the issue that you will be addressing. Tell them your what, what you think it's going to be your conclusion. So if you want to prove that a right had been violated, for example, tell them that you will, you, will, you will intend to demonstrate that the, the right was violated because A, B, and C, and you tell them why you think the right had been violated. So I don't know if I understood your question really. I hope, I hope that it was helpful, kind of. Um, I think I lost the chat briefly. Uh, thank you, okay. Um, did I address? Well, since, since we still have some more time, maybe um, I can ask you uh, a question, which is, um, in, in, in your experience, was the judging that you saw at the regional rounds any different from what you saw at the international rounds? And if yes, what are these differences and how should one um, prepare for this, bearing these differences in mind? Mm -hmm. That's actually a very good question. And at least for our regional rounds, I don't think I don't think they were much different. Um, no, they weren't. The one stood out for me is that the judges were very prepared, and that was also very nice. Because sometimes it's it can be a little bit frustrating as a mooter when you have the feeling that um, the the judges might not be as familiarized with the case or with the with the underlying arguments to each one of the issues. But in both cases, the judges were very, very well prepared. They knew which questions to ask, to ask and they were very helpful with everyone from, from with both teams to, to push us around a little bit maybe and to get the best from us. Mm, I, would, I would think that the difference actually was because my team got to the finals of the regional rounds and we had three very, very sort of calm judges. They were very, they were a little bit older and they were very patient in the way they addressed. They were less insistent and maybe I think that was the bigger difference, not necessarily in the international regional rounds, but maybe um, in the preliminary rounds and the actually finals of of the, um, of the regional rounds where the judges were took a more calm approach to questioning and in general to feedback. That was also very, very enriching. Hmm. Well, if there are no other questions from the participants, then maybe just to round this whole discussion off, I could ask you one last question, um, which is just what should one bear in mind for an online international round. I, I, I suppose you've also had experience with online international rounds having done that last year. This year as well, the entire moot is running online. So is there something specific that people should keep in mind, especially since, you know, it's not very easy to strike that interpersonal connection with judges um, through an online platform? Mm -hmm. But just to clarify, do you mean while pleading or the overall moot? Uh, pleading. Just while pleading, yeah. Okay, yeah. So I actually, I, I did, I pleaded and during the Jessup, I pleaded face to face and the prize was entirely online. I actually felt um, better online because you could, you had, for me at least, I could, the judges were nearer. <laughs> I, I could see their faces in my screen and we didn't have the, um, the physical distance. I mean, it paradox, it's a paradox because the difficult, the, the distance was there. It's just that I didn't feel it as much and I could actually see their faces much better. So I could maybe test 
the waters to see if they either agreed with what I was saying, or again, if they were maybe having trouble understanding the, a point I was trying to make. So as I said before, I'm all for silver, silver linings. And I think that's something we can, I appreciate, I highly appreciate from online pleading is that you can, you have, you have, at least for me, I felt that it was closer on a more personal level. It's a paradox, but at least that that was the case for me. Um, a quick tip that was actually very helpful for me. I used to plead with my headphones on. And I, as I was telling you guys before, I got very anxious. And then someone told me to try and get the headphones off that it would sort of get pressure out of my head. That completely changed my life. I cannot exaggerate that enough. So if you're feeling sort of um, like a little bit oppressed by your anxiety, take the headphones and plead without the headphones. It, it'll change your experience. It's, it's a little bit um, out of the blue, but it really did help me. Um, and otherwise, I'd also advise you to, to yes, to use, to use the online experience in your favor. And judges were also, at least both in the regional rounds and international rounds, they were very eager to listen to our feedback. They were, all of them, I think, gave us a space to discuss with them. Um, I mean, not the case because you're not allowed to do that, but if we had any questions they could answer or anything, they, they all of them had that space. And I thought that was very nice of them. I don't know how it was when it was face-to-face -face because I didn't have that experience during the prize. But I must say that for me, um, it was it was it was nice. Of course, I would have prepared. I would have preferred to to be there and to actually have the whole whole package experience. But it wasn't uh, as dramatic in my case. I think I I quite enjoyed it. I think there's one final question in the chat if you want to take that Maria and then maybe we can close the session. Super. Could you please shed some light on the criteria on the basis of which we are scored in the oral pleadings? Um, yes, I think actually I think the, the score sheets are available to everyone on the web page if I'm, if I'm not corrected. I think you are a judge on style, knowledge of the facts, knowledge of the law, Mm, and ability to answer questions if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Ah, yes. Oh, thank you for the link. And uh, yes, those those are the. It's that's actually a very good tip. I'd advise you all to take a look at the criteria you're being judged. So you're being judged upon, so you know what the judges are gonna have an eye, what they're gonna try and look at, uh, look for, and so you can be prepared to to know what you should be working on. Yes. Well, perfect. Since that brings us to the end of our time for this session as well, uh, maybe we, sh we can end here. Thank you so much again, Maria, for taking our time for this and leading the session so expertly. I'm absolutely certain that all our participants found the session incredibly helpful. <laughs> and participants, thank you for joining and all the very best for next week's rounds. I believe there is an orientation session scheduled for this Friday, so you will um, get more information even on the scoring criteria um, this Friday. So hope to see all of you then. Thank you again, Maria. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and thank you all for coming. I wish you very good luck. <laughs> Bye. Bye.